Amen, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everything, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Let's continue to worship God. Yes, you are. Darkness. 
joy, O God. Thank you for your promise, Lord, that we are reminded, O God, that we are not from this world, but Lord, we are for you, O God. We desire that day, Lord. This has been such a hard and devastating year for many of us. We have already been through so much. And just when we thought things were going to get better, COVID, uh, we again faced another devastation, no? the likes of which we have not seen before. Okay. Was just about to call it a year <laughs> last week. Actually, start just a month-long vacation on ta this week, and yet here we are. No, here we are. Nihirit pag yun si Odette. No, wag yun taon siya ni ni Undang. Now, I'm sure many of you, just like me, would like to sleep away all our troubles. Pero dili pwede, kay kinahanglan pa ta manglimpyo sa itong mga balay, nga nasudlan o baha, <laughs> kinahanglan pa ta magkaos o tubig, so laban lang yun, amen! Yay, laban! Hindi <laughs> pa ta ni pwede mo pa Hawaii. The last time I preached here, I actually preached on the Psalms of Lament. No? I never thought that I would echo David's words in Psalms 13, 
How long? <laughs> How long, Lord? How long will you forget me forever? No? How long will you hide your face from me? How long should I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? No? So, muna yung akong kuan, muna yung akong team song, karon nga tuig, no? I never thought it would be so prophetic of my struggles this year. Me and my family, no? I'm sure you knew what happened to us. However, this morning, I would like to redirect our focus from our own troubles, no? Uh, to God, no? From us to God, from ourselves to no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the end, it's not about us, it's about our Lord. Amen? No, so padayon lang yun ta. No, I started reading the Gospel of John last August in my daily devotions. Just about three weeks ago, ago when uh, Edgar and I had a conversation with Pastor Don Barry from New Zealand, he sent me a lot of his materials no, on the Gospel of John. So Don's materials have actually inspired me, no, have actually led to this message this morning, and there will be other messages as well on the book of John that I will be doing in the future. Uh, but I have long desired to do a, to do a book study and uh, do some series. No, Murag maibog ko when uh, I hear uh, Attorney William, si Pastor Edgar, sila man ay tigdimo og mga series diri sa ato. No? So I said to my heart whenever when I heard them last time that they did series, ako said, ako said, ganahan sa ko na Lord, pero now I finally have the opportunity to be able to do that. Now, just a disclaimer, <laughs> so good <called> disclaimer, <laughs> that I'm operating out of my deaf ear, okay? <laughs> because I'm usually a devotional or a prophetic uh, speaker. So I'm just praying for God's wisdom. Uh, so I may do justice to Don, Don's materials and to be able to give you the message that God has laid upon my heart for all of us this morning. Okay, so are you ready? On this Sunday morning, December 19, this is also our 26th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary. <laughs> I would like to invite you, each and every one of you, not to our anniversary party, wala mi anniversary party, but I would like to invite each and every one of you to do, to join me, no, as we deep dive into the Gospel of John. No, so everyone of you who are here, and every one of you who are watching from your homes this morning, okay, kung nabalik na ang inyong mga wifi, so let's Let's do that. Let's deep dive into the Gospel of John. And let's get right into it, no? Because we have lots of areas to cover, okay? So let's pray. Lord, we just open our hearts to you this morning. We open our hearts to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that your word says that your uh, word is like a double-edged sword. Lord, it pierces into the deepest recesses of our hearts. I pray that this morning as we, Lord, take a look at the Gospel of John, that, Lord, you will uh, just lodge into our hearts truths, Lord, that we can walk with, that we can journey with, that we can, Lord, uh, uh, adopt into our lives, O oh God, so that we will walk, always be walking in the truth, Lord, and always be walking in step with what you are doing, and uh, Lord, uh, the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So God, we thank you for this word uh, that you have prepared for us. Uh, we just commit to you, Lord, the sharing. I pray, Father, that you just help me to communicate clearly, Lord, uh, the message that you have prepared for your people. In Jesus' name, this we pray. Amen. Now, there are two areas of study that I would like to do this morning uh, on the Gospel of John. And uh, they are the preliminary issues and the 
prologue, okay? Now, if you have come across book studies before, you would know that they, it would deal with the preliminary issues first, no? And we're going to do the same, okay? Now, this covers who the author is, uh, the date and place of writing, the content, okay, next slide, the main themes, the purpose, etc., etc. We will try to cover all these issues uh, this morning. So, uh, just shake off the konobe, ang inyong mga kuan, para, para makakonsentrate ta, makafocus ta, in Jesus' name. No, let's shake off all our troubles, all our mga kakapoy, <laughs> no, so that we can just focus on, uh, because what I will be doing is not a uh, kining, kining, uh, murag, Yanura kay nga devotional, no, it's not, no. I will be giving you a lot of information that I hope you will be able to process. So, let's focus, okay? Most of all, most of us, okay, the first issue, the first issue that we will be dealing with uh, would be on who wrote John. Now, of course, all of us, I think, <laughs> would say, it's John, of course. Hello. <laughs> if asked, no? It's John, the son of Zebedee, is the, author, is the author of this gospel. But I was, in fact, surprised to find out that there are quarters, there are scholars who say he is not the writer. Okay? In fact, the other day, uh, I was able to come across materials that claims that it was the interpreter of John who wrote this gospel. He does have his reasons why, as I was looking at his material, he does have his reasons why he thinks John is not the author, but I would like, my, for myself, I would like to go with the popular belief that John is the writer. Now, why is this? Okay? Well, internal evidence from the gospel suggests it is John. Okay? The author claims to be an eyewitness, so it is highly unlikely that it is not one of the 12, okay, of the 12 disciples. Now, of the 12, we can eliminate Peter, Philip, Thomas, Judas Iscariot, uh, then Judas, son of James, and Nathaniel. Why? Because all these disciples were named in John's gospel, while the author himself only calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved, okay? Now, because they were named, we can leave them out, okay? So that leaves us with Matthew, Andrew, Simon, uh, James, and John, the son of Zebedee, and then James Alphaeus, okay? So there are other six that we do not know of. Now, Matthew wrote his own gospel. Andrew, Simon, and James Alphaeus are somewhat obscure, no? Because there is no record of them, them having written anything, now, James, son of Zebedee, the brother of John, was killed by Herod early in church history, and we will read that in Acts 12, okay? Now, this disciple whom Jesus loved was usually seen, by, seen side by side with Peter, uh, suggesting that he is one of the inner three, okay? Uh, composing of Peter, James, and John. So, by deduction... Uh, this leaves us with John, the son of Zebedee, as the author, most likely. Okay. Okay. Okay, <laughs> Okay, now, when was this written and where was this written? Now, these are important because as you read the Gospel of John, they actually bear on the things that are written uh, there. Okay? Now, there are two thoughts uh, as to when... This gospel was written either early AD 60, this was 30 years after Jesus died, or late, uh, which is AD 90, 60 years after Jesus uh, died, okay? Now, most scholars favor a later date. And would, uh, so if uh, it was a later date, this would have been written by John in Ephesus in mid-90s, Okay? Now, this is the last gospel that was written. Of that, uh, the scholars are pretty unanimous, no? Uh, so, because this was the last gospel that, that was written, there are issues 
Uh, there are differences with the other synoptics who was written earlier. And there's, there's, these are uh, because John's gospel is markedly different with the other gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? As I've said, they were written earlier uh, than John. Uh, these three gospels are otherwise known as the synoptics. Okay, Mar uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptics. Why are they called the synoptics? Because they are broadly similar. They are easily harmonized. Okay, so, but John, John's gospel is quite different. Light siya. Now, and I will tell you why lit uh, later. But the differences uh, in John's gospel with the other synoptics uh, first is uh, geographically, no, the synoptics concentrate on Jesus' Jesus's ministry in Galilee. Okay, Galilee is in the northern part of Israel, while John's emphasis is on Jesus' ministry in Judea and Jerusalem. Okay, and this is on the southern part of Israel. Now, we can see that in Matthew 4.12 and Matthew 19.1. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 4.12 withdrew to Galilee and then in Matthew 19.1 uh, he then left Galilee. Everything between Matthew 4.12 and 19.1 happened. All the events that was written there, all the discourses, all the uh, sermons uh, that happened there were happened in Galilee, okay, which is really the majority of the book, Matthew has 28 chapters, so uh, this is already majority of the book. Mark and Luke cover basically the same area, okay, so that's one. It's different geog geographically. It's also different chronologically, okay? Without John's gospel, it would have been difficult to establish the length of Jesus' ministry. The synoptics actually only cover about one and one half years, of Jesus' ministry, but it was John's gospel that reports three and perhaps four Passovers, which, now because this happens once a year, the scholars were able to deduce that the public, of, public ministry of Jesus actually ran for about three to three and a half years. Now that was because of John's gospel, okay? Now John also records most of Jesus' early ministry than the synoptics. Okay, let me show you a graph, uh, the chronology of events. Now, uh, between Matthew 4.11, which is the temptation of Jesus, and Matthew 4.12, it's like a verse, no? Uh, John the Baptist imprisonment, imprisonment, and because of that, Jesus left for Galilee. In between that, the first five chapters of John was actually written, Okay. Uh, there are so many events there. There are many events and miracles that took place. There was the wedding of Cana. There was the first cleansing of the temple. If you actually do not know that there are two cleansing of the temples, no, but this one, one happened. Uh, this one is the first. And then there were conversations with Nico, Nicodemus at night. There was the conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well. And there was the healing of the nobleman's. Uh, son, there was also the healing of the blind man, uh, no, the layman at the pool of Bethsaida, and many other events actually took place between John 2 and 5. Now, why is this important? Okay, because when you actually go to Matthew 4:18, uh, the calling of the first disciples happened there. Now, Jesus actually went and saw Peter and Andrew. And told them, come, follow me. No, ningun siya. Come, follow me. And then Matthew actually tell, tells us, at once they left. How sa mana? No, if you only had Matthew, no sa mana siya, Lord, follow sa na zombie zombie. Wa mo kapangutan na ana, ano nga? Huh? At once, wala mga ni sila ka ila kang Jesus, wala sila kapangutan na king sa mangka. Why are you calling us? No, who are you? No, so matingala ka. If you actually do not know, nga John 2 verses, uh, chapters 2 to 5 happened. No, so what, what 
happened there is that Peter and Andrew and all the other disciples were witnessed already what happened. You know? They were there from afar. They saw Jesus perform the miracle at the wedding. They saw Jesus heal. They saw Jesus uh, <coughs> cleanse the te temple. So that when Jesus actually said, come follow me, oh, they said, oh yes, we're coming. Amen? So you know, it's no? It's important that we actually know what the chronology is. Okay. Now, John's gospel is also different in terms of content. Now, because John wrote his gospel so much later than all the other synoptics, he was already familiar with what the other gospel writers wrote. No, and didn't see actually much of a need to repeat what they have already written. So that's why he leaves out a lot of what the Synoptics Gospel has covered. In fact, in John's Gospel, there is no Christmas story, there is no birth events, there is no genealogy, okay, and no mention of Jesus' baptism. There's no single verse in, in John's Gospel of Jesus confronting the, de the demonic, no? which is prevalent in all the synoptics. Now, there's no Sermon on the Mount. There's no transfiguration. There's no mention of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's no Last Supper. There's no record of the Ascension. Okay, so many of these things John left out from his gospel because he knew that all the synoptics actually covered these areas already. So then, uh, because he left much of the material out, he also puts into his story a lot of material that the others do not reference, okay? So, for example, there is seven, and then possibly eight if you include uh, the miracle in the epilogue, now, five of, uh, five of which are not mentioned in the synoptics. Now, the only common miracle that all four of them actually wrote about was the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water, okay? Now, he also concentrates on Jesus' ministry on individuals rather than the masses, okay? And he records seven key conversations in the synoptics um, that, uh, that the synoptics also don't cover. And this one includes the conversation with Nathaniel, the conversation, as I've said already, with Nicodemus, uh, the Samaritan woman, um, Martha, Pilate, Mary Magdalene, and then Peter. No? So he took the time to record those conversations. Now, Jesus in John's Gospel doesn't also teach in parables, no? Uh, that's very common in all the other synoptics, no? but not in John. He teaches in long, sometimes controversial discourses. Okay, and then the last thing is that John records more about what Jesus says about himself than the others do. Okay, in John, he makes this great I am statements, okay? And there are seven of them, okay? Now, John actually likes the number seven, no? Because he has seven miracles, then he has these seven deep conversations with individuals, and then he also has seven I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. I am the bread of life, no? Uh, he has seven of these statements with a predicate, no? But there are also seven other I am statements without a predicate, meaning uh, there was this time when he said to the Jews, uh, now before Abraham was, I am. No? So he has these seven statements in John's gospel, seven with a predicate, I am statements, seven with a predicate, and seven without a predicate. Okay, now, John was quite selective. Uh, of the three years of Jesus' ministry, he actually covers only about 20 days. Now, he, as I've said, he only recorded seven miracles, uh, but Matthew had 20, Mark had 18, and Luke had 20. 
Okay, so he was quite selective uh, in the things he wrote. Now, why did John, actually the question is, why did John wrote the way he did? Okay, what was his purpose in writing? What was, what objectives uh, did he hope to, over, uh, to achieve uh, with his gospel? Now, we aren't left to guess, okay? He actually has a statement of purpose, and that is found in John 20, verses 30 to 31. And it says there, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Okay? So, what is the purpose statement? Why he actually wrote uh, his gospel? John here was saying, I was selective in the number of signs. There was dozens that he did, but I only picked out seven because the, these seven that I picked out are in order for you to believe, okay? That you may believe that he is the Son of God, and by so doing, you will have life. Okay, my purpose ni John. Okay, it is interesting that in the Greek language, the verbs here are in the present tense continuous. Okay, it means to be continually doing something. So John 20 verse 30 to 31 is actually translated, better translated this way. But these are written that you may go on believing. Okay, so that we... Um, that Jesus, sorry, that Jesus is the, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by going on believing, you will go on having life in his name. Okay, so that is better translated that way. It is a continuous action, okay? So, John actually did not write uh, so much his gospel for uh, people, no, as an evangelistic tool for people to get across no, into life or into light, but it is written for people like you and me. No? So that we might go on believing in order that we may go on having God's life in us. Now, I will therefore encourage each one of you who may be tired, no, those of you who are weary, uh, those of you who are on the verge of giving up, if you are like me, no, just to be honest, I'm really, really tired. No, I'm really, really tired. I'm pretty tired. And uh, I wish sometimes, no, kami sa mga sisters would say, I wish uh, we could just erase 2021 in our <laughs> calendar, in our lives, no, kung pwede pa lang. Um, you know, start reading the book of John. Start reading the gospel of John because these are written so that we may go on believing. If you are tired and you do not like to believe, if you are weary and you are the verge of tinood bagyod ni, tinood bagyod ni nga si Jesus is with me, no tinood bagyod ni, murag wala naman ko kadungog sa iya, murag wala naman siya diri sa akong kinabuhi, murag wala naman ko yung mga prayers na iyang gipang, uh, gipang tubag. No, if you are on that verge, read the Gospel of John. Okay, so that while you're reading, read it in the lens of why John wrote it. Okay, so that as we believe, we may go on having uh, God's life in us, which is what we really, really need right now. Now, God's life in us. No, just that bubbling uh, life. No, the zeal. Uh, that consumes us, the passion that consumes us, okay? Now, there are three key words in uh, this purpose statement. One of these is simeon, which means signs. No, it is a deed or miracle that has a significant meaning behind it, no? Uh, and it is valuable not so much for what it is, 
but for what it points toward. Okay? So John is saying the signs that I have selected here, they are Simeon. Now they are Simeon. They have a deep underlying truth. Okay? Each of the signs that John chose, each of the miracles that John uh, chose is set to display a spe special characteristic of Jesus' power and person. For example, in the healing of the nobleman's son, we actually see him just saying, go, go, and your son is healed. No, that's about 30 meters away. No, when he see, said that, no, so we can see him as master over distance. Okay, wala, wala problema sa iya kung unsa kakalayo. No, he can reach you. By his word, he can touch you. Wherever you are right now, whatever your situation is right now, God's arm can actually touch you. Ayaw, guna, guna, nga kalayo ba sa ginusa ako? No, don't think that. Because Jesus is actually master over distance. No, it doesn't matter. No, uh, or even in the raising of Lazarus, no, we can see that he is master of death. Now, each of these signs actually shows us Jesus' transcendence, okay? How he is master of the factors of life, which we have no control of, okay? These signs are written so that you may believe. Okay, now the other key word there is uh, believe, or what we call pistio, pistio. T-O. Now, when supernatural signs are present, there are only two reactions. Acceptance or rejection. Now, one of the themes that runs in John's gospel is this struggle between belief and unbelief, between acceptance and rejection, between light and darkness. Okay? John actually wants to swing the reader uh, to the side of acceptance, which is embodied in this word, believe. Okay? So it is used 98 times in this gospel alone. No? That is how uh, much of uh, importance this is, this particular be, uh, a word. It is an action word. So it is not just an intellectual assent. No? Dili, dili. No, this kind of belief is an active uh, belief. Okay? Uh, what John is saying here is that you have to believe into. You have to keep on believing. Keep on leaning unto me. Okay? Readjusting your life uh, because you receive me. That's what faith is about. Okay? So all of this written so that you become one of those believing people that John uh, is saying here. Where your life is constantly being shaped uh, by virtue of what you believe. Okay? Then he says, in order that. Okay? These signs are written so that you may choose to believe and the outflow of that belief is that you may have life. Again, life is one of the key words in John's gospel. So which brings us to the third key word uh, in the purpose of John, which is life. There are two words for life here, bias and zoe. Now bias is our natural life. It's the life that we actually get uh, from our parents. Um, <clears throat> So when, um, but it is not the word that uh, John uses when he talks about eternal life because he uses uh, Zoe, okay? And basically that what he is saying here is that when you are a believer, bias will run out, but Zoe never will, okay? Bias will run out, but Zoe never will. In John 11 verse 25 to 26 when he was talking when Jesus was actually talking to Mary and Martha uh, around about the raising of Lazarus he says I am the resurrection and the Zoe okay I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me will live though he may die okay 
what he's saying, Jesus was saying here, though he who believes in me, though bias will run out, Zoe never will. Okay? Zoe never will. Whoever has Zoe and believes in me will never die. Will never die. Even though bias will run out. And he says to Mary and Martha, do you believe that? Okay, do you believe that? Okay. Now, Zoe is actually carefully defined by Jesus. In John 17, verse 3, he says, Now this is eternal Zoe. Now this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now you want everlasting life? Uh, it is wrapped up in the knowledge of God and His Son, Jesus. Otherwise... We have bias, and uh, when bias runs out, that's it. Okay? Okay, so that's John's purpose statement. And the whole gospel is actually built around this. He is saying, when you read my gospel, now you have to read it in the light of why I wrote it. Okay? I picked out selectively some signs so that you may become a believing person and an ongoing believing person and the result for you would be Zoe. Okay, you will get to know God. You will experience life. Okay. Now, main themes. Okay, I'm almost done with the uh, preliminary issues. No, the first one is Christology. No? Uh, one of the main themes of uh, John is Christology. That's a big word, but the heart of the presentation of John's gospel is Christ. That's who he is. No? The synoptics actually focus more on what Jesus did and said, but John gives us a portrait of Jesus' inner life and his self-identity. The other theme is soteriology. No, it's another big word, but it just simply means the doctrine of salvation. Early on, we are actually introduced in John's Gospel about the name of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, the whole movement of John's Gospel is actually towards the cross and the resurrection where salvation is achieved. Many times in John's Gospel, Jesus would say, My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has, yet, has not yet come. And then when you come to the end, he says, Now, this is the hour. Okay? It all leads to the cross, and to uh, where salvation is actually achieved. Now, the third is pneumatology, or the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now, John's gospel actually contains the most explicit teaching about the Holy Spirit. Okay. The fourth is his use of the Old Testament. Now, John's gospel, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, will be re should be read in the light of Genesis. I will be talking about that later. And then John 1 to 4, 4, uh, verse 14 uh, is, should also be read in the light of Exodus. Now, so, dagang kayo siya mga references to the Old Testament. There are many uh, Old Testament uh, verses that he actually uses in his gospel. And he also has many and frequent allusions to the Jewish story. Okay, now these are actually embedded in his gospel. For example, he says Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the uplifted servant. He is Jacob's ladder. Now, if you actually do not know, if you haven't actually read the OT, these things are actually meaningless to you. You would not understand. Okay, so he, John's gospel actually makes many references to, those, uh, uh, to the Old Testament uh, story. Now, John's gospel also has emphasis on individual believers, which is uh, quite unique no? in, a, uh, in a collective culture, uh, such as Judaism in the first century. Now, uh, Paul's letters and all the other synoptics actually emphasize the corporate nature of the Christian community, but John highlights the faith of the individual believers and the discipleship of indiv individuals. The one who is actually used 37 times, if anyone 14 times, anyone who 12 times, okay? John's gospel actually values the relationship of personal intimacy between the individual believer 
and Jesus. Okay, now, last one on the preliminary issues. We have the breakdown of John's gospel here. I have referenced Muriel Tenney uh, for this breakdown. Next uh, slide. And uh, <clears throat> there are others, but I chose to actually uh, use Tenney in, in, in the breakdown. And it starts with the prologue and then the body, which composes of different periods, periods of consideration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and then we go to the epilogue. Okay. Whew. Those were the preliminary issues. <laughs> okay. So, kamay na lang atong time. Let's go to the prologue. Okay. The prologue is actually composed of the first 18 verses of John. Don't worry. I'm not going to take all the 18 verses. Okay. I'm just going to choose three key verses. Uh in the prologue, and uh, John, that is John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, and John 1.18. The rest actually are what we call parenthetical, meaning that if you actually take them out, all these three verses uh, will still make sense, okay? But these are the three key verses in the prologue, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.14, 1, and John 1.18. Now, John actually gives us an explanation of all that will follow in the prologue and all the main themes will be introduced here and uh, but will be expanded later on in his book. I will still be doing a number of series on the Gospel of John uh, on the following chapters, but for this time, I will be concentrating on John verses 1 to 18. Now, what really is clear as we follow John's Gospel is that Christianity is not about a philosophy, okay? It is not about a doctrine or a teaching, although there are, uh, that's included, but it is about a person. Now, and this is quite unique because of all the religions in the world, uh, Christianity is the only, you know, if you can call it a religion, religion it is the only uh, religion that actually revolves around the person of its founder. Now, all the others are actually Buddha, you know, it's about the teachings of Buddha, Confucius, uh, Islam is the same, you no, know? so it is completely unique, you no, know? uh, because others thought about God, Jesus claims he is God. Okay, not one of the recognized religious leaders, okay, not Paul, not Moses, Buddha, Muhammad, or Confucius, actually claim that they are God. No? Only Jesus did. And also, katong to sa Davao. No, mga puto siya. Sa puto siya, claim, claim lang po. No? <laughs> but, uh, it's about the person. No? So, Jesus is actually very crucial. And what John does is he introduces him to us. He wants us to know who he is and where he came from. Okay? Now, one of the challenging things in writing a biography of a person is where to start. Okay? All the four gospel writers actually face this dilemma. Now, the answer to this question is determined uh, by their, their ultimate objective in writing their story. Uh, so let's look at those. Mark actually dives straight into the story. He launches immediately into Jesus' public ministry. Now, why is this? Because uh, Mark wants to show that Jesus is actually the fulfillment of the suffering servant uh, verses in Isaiah, now that Isaiah, Isaiah actually wrote about. So he is the, Jesus is, in Mark's gospel, Jesus is the ideal servant who has come to do the will of God. That's why he doesn't have any genealogy. Because who, who wants to read about the genealogy of a servant? No, you only want to know what a servant does and what he do uh, and what he achieves, okay? So Mark launches immediately into what Jesus did. Now Matthew went further back into this, uh, in the story. He was actually writing largely to a Jewish audience and he tries to show his audience 
that Jesus is the promised Messiah, which came of Jewish uh, prophecy and scripture. That's why in Matthew's gospel, you will actually have this phrase, constantly, it is written. It is written. No? Because he goes back uh, to the Jewish story. So because he goes back uh, to the Jewish story, Matthew starts with, the, the, with Jesus' genealogy. And he actually links it back to Abraham. Okay? He links Jesus with the story of Abraham. Now Luke goes even further because Luke's objective is to show that Jesus is the perfect man. And that his genea so that's why his genealogy actually goes right back not to Abraham, but to Adam. No? To Adam. To show that Jesus is in fact a bona fide human being. Okay? So each of them has a starting point depending on what they want to tell. Now John goes back the farthest of all. Of all the four gospels. He goes back into eternity past. Okay? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No more na'y opening verse ni John. Now, this verse actually sounds like Genesis 1.1. Diba? I said before that it has to be read in the light of Genesis. No, because Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Now, it is meant to sound like Genesis 1. Because Genesis 1.1 is the beginning of the, the, or is the start of the material creation. But John actually goes further than the material creation. He is not saying that somewhere in the distant past, this person called the world, word began to exist. No, dilina mo yung gusto istorya diha. In the Greek, actually, the article the is absent. No, it does not exist. So it actually reads in beginning. When what John is saying here is that uh, no matter how far you go back, no, bisag aha pa ka, no, mo ato. He already existed. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The first time you encounter the Word, He already existed. He was. Now, kanang word nga was has to, uh, there are actually two Greek words that are used with was. No? And, um, uh, Sometimes our, uh, our English word only has one, uh, so that sometimes we lose the distinction. Now, one uh, Hebrew word is called igenito, uh, which conveys the idea of something coming into being, and it is used in the prologue. You know, in the verse uh, John 1, 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. It was also used in John 1, 14, uh, and the word... Eugenito made flesh. No, mona diya gigamit na nga word. Um, what it means is that there's a coming into being, no? At a certain point in time, at a certain point in time, John came. No? Or at a certain point in time, the word was made flesh. No? But there was a point in time that that did not happen. That did not exist. That is what eugenito actually means. Okay? But there's another word, the Greek word en or en, no? which means existence. Now, it is used in John 8.58, uh, where you will probably remember uh, that Jesus here is actually uh, arguing with the Pharisees, and he, and he says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw my day and was glad and they were shocked. No? In fact, this was one of the reasons that they actually got angry with Jesus. No? Because he says, what are you talking about? You're not even 50. No? And you say, Abraham saw your day and was glad? No? And he was thrilled? What, what are you saying? No? Before Abraham was, uh, Jesus was saying, because before Abraham was, I am. 
before Abraham Iginito, I-E-N. Naging ana siya pagka-render, I was. Okay, that's the second Greek word. It's the Greek word that says, uh, in the beginning existed the word. Not came into being, but it existed. Okay? So, in John's first statement, he actually ascribes to the word this eternity of being. And only God has this attribute. Okay, we actually find uh, that similar in Micah 5.2, where he says, O Bethlehem, Ephrath, you are but a small Judean village, yet you will be the birthplace of my king, who is alive from everlasting ages past. Okay, only God has self-existence. Jesus has always been God. Okay? Amen. Amen. Mona ang ginoong atong gialagaran. Now, in the beginning, sunod ya, in the beginning was the word. Now, have you ever wondered why did John actually use word? No, ang, ang verb, ang, ang Greek ana is logos. Nga naman si John Ano logos man yang gigamit? In the beginning was logos. Ano wala man niya gamita? Ang pangalan ni Jesus, in the beginning was Jesus. Now, wala mo kapangutan na, Ana. Now, why didn't he use his human name? Or why didn't he use, in the beginning was the Son of God? But he says, in the beginning was logos. Okay? Now, just on a practical sense, by definition, a word is actually a connecting link uh, between two people. No? A pattern of sound that expresses one's uh, thought and enters another, okay? Gives expression to and reveals the thoughts of one to the other, okay? Kung dili ko mo istorya, none of you actually knows what I'm thinking. If I actually don't use words to uh, express what I think, digin mo kabalo, no? And many times of the scri- in the scripture, we are asked the question, who knows the mind of God, No? Kinsa may nakabalo sa pangalan, asa ah, huna-huna sa gino. That's in 1 Corinthians 2.16. Now, we cannot possibly know the mind of God unless He speaks to us, unless He reveals Himself to us. No? So, God in this verse actually is saying that in the person of Jesus, in the Word, is me, are my thoughts. Are, is my mind, no? He is the medium, the vehicle of communication between God and man. Now, it's not only in that sense, but also in history. John did, just didn't pick out a, the word logos and threw it into the culture without everyone understanding what logos is. Because in history, 600 years before John, Heraclitus, actually a philosopher, asked the question, is there any meaning, is there any purpose, any pattern, any logos in life? Okay? Because for the Greeks, logos was a philosophical idea. Now, men and women over the ages, dili lang sila, dili lang ang mga Greeks, actually have always sought for some purpose uh, or meaning in life. It's actually embedded in all our intellectual pursuits. For example, biology is biologos. Okay? Psych- sociology is social logos. No? Psychology is psyche logos. Okay? So, kitatanan are searching for meaning. No? In fact, Plato, in his theory of forms, actually said, and this was um, hundreds of years before uh, Jesus came. I hope that someday there will come a logos from God because we are all in the dark. Okay? So, mona history. So, now comes John's gospel. And John says here, he arrives in the scene and says to them all, I know this logos. Okay? The logos that you are seeking is not an impersonal it. It is not an idea. It is not a philosophy. No? It is a personal he. No, this logos, no, in the beginning was the logos. I know him. No, I know him. He is God. And he is the meaning of it all. Whatever questions you have in life, Jesus, the word, the logos, is the meaning of it all. In fact, Paul, 
in 1 Corinthians verse 1 to 17 says, He is the beginning of all things, and in Him all things consist. Okay? All things consist. Now, the Moffat Bible actually uh, renders that in Him all things cohere. Okay? Because without Jesus, without Jesus, we have nothing but incoherence. We do not understand. Wala ta kasabot, wala ta kabalo. No, why we are here. Nga no man giyod, gipakatao man ko sa ginoon sa may akong purpose. No, in life. Why is God calling me? No, on sa man. No, but with Jesus, all things go here. If you actually do not know why you are here, if you actually do not know, nga no ni abot ta sa ingon ani, nga punto sa imong kinabuhi, no? Jesus is your answer because in Him all things go here. Okay? Amen! Hapit na kumahuman! The third phrase of verse 1 is categorical in its assertion. And the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Okay? Now, Kung wapagin mo kasabot atong in the beginning. <laughs> Muna ni, ningon, balik-balik yun ni John, actually, no? And the word was God. Now, throughout the sentences, as I've said, the Greek tenses are in the imperfect, suggesting continuous action. So, in the Greek, this verse is actually translated, in the beginning was the word, a continuous fact, Okay? And the word was with God continuously. And the word was God constantly. Munana siya pagkarender. Now talk about an explosive start. No, si John. Mona siya. Ang iyang. So, ako lang i-take up ang next few verses. Uh, after uh, verse 1-1, one, one, kadali lang. He was with God in the beginning. No, talk about one, two punches, no? Kung wala pag nakasabot atong first nga sentence, mao pa. No, yeah, pag lo, he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. No, without him, nothing was made that has been made. He goes, he expresses it in the positive, through him, all things were made. And then he expresses it again in the negative, without him, nothing was made that was made, Okay. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. Okay, now this whole idea of darkness and light, acceptance and rejection, belief and unbelief is a theme that runs right through John's gospel. It is started in the, in the prologue. It is developed right through. Now, note that in verses 10 and 11, it says there, he came into his own but his own received him not. In the Greek, actually, there's a bit of distinction. No, usay mangod kini nga tong English nga words. Dili mangod kayo siya as colorful as the Greek language. There's a bit of distinction there. He's it's actu it's actually rendered. He came into his own things, but his own people received him not. Okay, but his own things did. No, when Jesus actually said to the storm, be still, the storm stopped. Now his own things received him. When he says to the fishes, jump into the net, they all jump. When he says to the bread, multiply, no, they, it multiplied. His own things received him, but his own people did not. Now it, it's so tragic. I hope not one of us here rejects Jesus eventually, okay? Then again, in verse 12, there's this acceptance and rejection theme again. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, uh, nor of human decision. So there are those, again, that accept him, and there are those that reject him. Now to borrow Shakespeare, to believe or not to believe, okay, that is... The question for all of us, to believe or not to believe. And this is John's gospel. So either you believe or you reject, you battle, you're in the light or you're in the dark. 
Okay, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, the word dwelt there literally meant he pitched his tent or he tabernacled among us. Now, as I've said before, that this verse actually cannot be read uh, without thinking of Exodus. In fact, when this verse, when John wrote this verse, immediately the, the, his hearers, which are the Jews, I know they are brought back to the time of the Exodus where they actually built the tent, you know, and uh, they're actually thinking uh, of the tabernacle and the glory of God that they came into it. And uh, they think of Moses who prayed, Lord, show me your glory, and the glory of the Lord passed by. You know, in the Amplified Bible, it says there, and the word Christ became flesh and tabernacled or fixed his tent uh, among us, okay? And uh, such glory as an only begotten son receives from his father, full of grace. So it has to be read in the light of Exodus. Okay, now the last verse. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. Now, the word declare is actually taken from the Greek word exeseo seeto tio. Ang botong sao pagpronounce, sana di ko kabalo. Where our English word exegesis actually comes from. No? So, uh, exegesis is actually the critical explanation or interpretation of a text, of a difficult text actually, uh, or a difficult scripture. Now, most of uh, William, uh, Edgar, Delora actually uses exegesis when they uh, preach here, and sometimes I do as well. No, dili me kayo topical. There are others who also do topical, but most of us do an exegesis. Now, when somebody actually does an exegesis of a scripture, the hope is that they take a passage which is difficult and that they exegete it, meaning they bring it out, show you what the words mean, just like what I'm doing now, and then how they fit together so it becomes plain. So actually, when you hear it, you actually say, Ah, mo de to. Mo de to ibot pasabot at tong a verse. No, yun na ang hope sa exegesis. Na usahay, di mo na mahitabo. Usahay, malibog naman hinoon ta. Pero, mo na siya ang hope sa exegesis. Now, this is what John is saying here. No? Jesus declares the Father. Jesus actually exegetes the Father. No? Jesus exegetes who the Father is. Jesus exegetes the Father's heart. Jesus exegetes the Father's will and plans. Now, in the Amplified Bible, it says there, He has revealed Him. Mono, mono ang exegesis, no? He has brought Him out where He can be seen. He has interpreted Him. He has made Him known. Yun na, no? Jesus declared Him. Jesus revealed the Father. Now, Jesus brought Him out where He can be seen. Sa mo na karon, kailan na ta? Kinsa, kinsa si Father God, no? Mo na karon, Kabalo na ta. Unsa iyang una-una? Mo na karon through Jesus, we can actually have a relationship with him. No, he is because he has made him known. Jesus exegetes the Father. That's why in John 14, no, uh, when 8 verses 9 when Philip actually said, "Lord, show us the Father." And that will be enough for us. No murag naglingon-lingon si si Jesus adto, no? Mo na nakaingon siya, "Don't you know me, Philip?" No, even after I have been among you for such a long time, uh, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Kinsa sa inyo dere ang wala pa kaila kang God the Father. Mahal, look. No, get to know Jesus because Jesus exegetes God the Father. Okay? There is not some plan in the Father's heart that is not revealed in the person of the Son. There is only one story, one narrative in the entire Bible, and Jesus is the central figure of that narrative. Okay? 
God's plans are knowable in and through the work of Christ. So, in conclusion, oh man, ko, praise the Lord. <laughs> deep dive into no, no deep, the next few weeks. Forget about your troubles. Go into the book of John, okay? Because it is truly the most amazing of books. Amen. Amen. Thank you.